Okay, so welcome to the section on non-contrast chest CT. So I'm basically going to show you a basic search pattern for looking at a non-contrast chest CT. And uh, first, I just kind of want to start with a technique. So what is the technique of the study I'm looking at? It's a non-contrast study. It's done in this particular set of images in the axial plane. These are at thin sections. You can see the slice thickness here is 1.25 millimeters. And this set of images is really the best set of images for evaluating the lung parenchyma, which is the main goal of a non-contrast chest CT. Uh, so basically, the basic approach I have to imaging is I, I know about the technique, I try to know the anatomy really well, and then try to know about common pathologies I'm likely to see and how to diagnose them. And then as far as uh, a search pattern, basically you want to take the chest and split it up in different anatomic sections and look at each thing separately, again confirming normal anatomy and then trying to exclude common diseases. So with the chest, I basically split it up into uh, lung parenchyma, pleura, I look at the airways. I also split up then the mediastinum into mediastinal fat and nodes. I look at the vessels, and I look at the heart. And then other things I look at, I look at the axilla for nodal tissue. I look at the soft tissues, including the muscles. And then lastly, I look at the bones. So let me start with how I look at the lung parenchyma. So here again, I'm on thin sections, lung windows of the axial imaging set. Looking at the lung parenchyma, confirming here this normal anatomy, it should be an air-filled structure. It should be dark on CT. There's all these branching structures within, which are the vessels. And there's basically pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins coursing through. And it should be nice tapering out to the periphery. And I, I'm trying to exclude that there is increased attenuation of the lung parenchyma. That's the typical abnormality is that the lung airspace is filled, can be filled with blood, pus, water, or cells, and I'm trying to exclude that there is any sort of increased attenuation of the lung parenchyma. I'm confirming that it's air-filled and dark. And there's other category of uh, lung disease where you can have cystic changes or increased lucency of the lung parenchyma. Um, and this patient actually has a very mild form of that. You can see these small cystic changes here in the lung periphery, uh, especially here at the lung apices, uh, subpleural lung, and that's just mild emphysema. So as I'm looking at the lung prank, I'm looking for increased attenuation, decreased attenuation. I also want to screen for lung nodules on every thin section uh, set of imaging. And these are thin sections at 1.25 millimeters. So I look for lung nodules. And how do I look for lung nodules? Basically split up the lung into basically one half here. And I just focus my eye on that one region. And not, not particularly the lobe, but just one region of the lung. And I'm basically scrolling up slowly and looking for a nodule of tissue to catch my eye in that region. I'm going to see all these branching vessels which will come in and out of the plane, but a small nodule should kind of come in and then slowly uh, kind of blip out as it's only present in a few slices. So I'm kind of looking for that abnormality. And I look at for lung nodules in all areas of the lung and uh, basically do a screening for lung nodules in every patient once I get thin section imaging. So after I look at the lung prank, I'm all looking for increased attenuation, decreased attenuation, I'm looking for screening for lung nodules, and pay my attention to the uh, pleura. So you can see the pleura here is, you, you can't quite see it, but it's in this region. It basically lines both the lung and the, um, the thoracic cage, and it's a double-lined uh, space, and there's a potential space inside which contains a small amount of pleural fluid. And if you look in that region, I can pick up findings in the pleura most commonly a pleural effusion, which would be layering here posteriorly. One of the things, though, I make sure that I, I look at the pleura in all, on all parts of the chest uh, because I, I don't want to miss things such as uh, less commonly found pleural findings, such as pleural calcifications or pleural nodularity, and there can rarely be pleural tumors. So I basically look anteriorly, posteriorly, laterally, and medially, looking for any pleural abnormalities and look at each lung knowing that if I don't specifically look at the pleura, I might miss some findings in the pleura. So after looking at the pleura, I then pay attention to the airways. You can see here the main airway to the uh, lungs. This is the trachea. You can see the bifurcation here into the uh, right and left main bronchi. And what am I looking for? Basically, it should be a nice air-filled structure. And I'm looking for any filling defect within that structure. Uh, most commonly, it's uh, aspirated mucus or secretions, which can lead to an aspiration pneumonia. Um, other things you can find in these smaller airways sometimes is a lung cancer can start in the airway, occlude the airway, and lead to an opacity and, or a consolidation within the lung. 
post obstructive process. A lot of times in the trachea, I can see uh, mucus, which has been aspirated, uh, but also uncommonly, there can be tumors of the trachea itself that you want to make sure you look for and exclude. And uh, so basically, I look at uh, each part of the lung, kind of how I outline on the bronchopulmonary segments video. Uh, again, looking for filling defects within the bronchi. So, okay, so we looked at the lung parenchyma, looked at the pleura, looked at the airways. Next thing I'll, I'll put my attention to is the mediastinum. I'm in a uh, soft tissue plane or uh, window. And now basically I'm looking at the mediastinum and you can see here the mediastinal fat, this low density region here, which is the same color as the subcutaneous fat. I'm looking for these small little regions within the fat, which are the lymph nodes. And I'm looking for enlarged lymph nodes. I'm looking for a lymph node that is greater than one centimeter in short axis. And you can see here a little flat node here right in the paratracheal region and basically looking for node tissue in all the different areas where they can be, which include the uh, subcrinal region, the prevascular region. Um, you can have nodes around the esophagus. You can have nodes uh, underneath the heart, uh, between the heart and the diaphragm. And also there's uh, commonly missed areas in the supraclavicular region. So I'm basically looking for enlarged nodes. I'm also looking in the hyalur regions for enlarged nodes, which a lot of times we'll say because we can't tell the difference here in the hyla between the pulmonary vessels and the actual nodal tissue, we'll say evaluation for hyalur adenopathy is limited without intravenous contrast, and that's true. Uh, other place I look for nodes is also the axillary regions here. You can see multiple small, small non-enlarged nodes here in the axilla. All these small nodes. This is a node of the fatty hilum. And in the axilla, we're looking for a node measurement of 1.5 to 2 centimeters to call it enlarged. I just want to point out that we're seeing here this, this dense structure here is the thyroid gland. It uh, has iodine within it, so it's dense. And I basically comment on the thyroid that, first of all, that it's not completely imaged. And if I see a nodule or enlargement, then uh, those need to be both clinically correlated and then possibly worked up with an ultrasound. Okay, so we looked at the mediastinum for looking at the fat. So next thing I look at is look at the vessels. So here I can see this venous structure here to the right of the midline, and it's receiving blood from another venous structure here, the brachycephalic vein. And this is the SVC here. And I can come down, I can see the azygous vein coming into the SVC here posteriorly. And as I keep coming down, the azygous will turn into the right atrium. And again, I'm not seeing the the difference between the myocardium and the blood within the heart that well because there's no intravenous contrast, but I can at least see the right atrium. I can see here the right ventricle. Basically now I can assess the right ventricular outflow tract, which is right here. I can see the main pulmonary artery and the right and left pulmonary arteries. And I basically want to get a measurement of the main pulmonary artery and exclude uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So this person is at 27 millimeters, which is normal. And the upper limit of normal would be or 30, 29 to 30 millimeters. So then going through the left side of vasculature, we can start here with the left atrium. And you can see here the pulmonary veins coming into the left atrium. We come down here, we can see the left, left ventricle of the heart. And I keep coming up, I can see the left ventricular outflow tract, I can see the uh, ascending thoracic aorta, here are the coronary arteries. There's the right coronary artery. This was the left coronary artery here. And as I keep coming up, I can see the ascending thoracic aorta here anteriorly. It comes up here to give off the three vessel arch, the normal anatomy here. Brachycephalic, left common carotid, and the uh, left subclavian. And I keep coming down here, and then I can follow the descending thoracic aorta. And I like to get measurements of the aorta. I usually use the I'll use the coronal plane to get measurements of the aorta. And I can see here the nice the plane of the aorta, and I want to be transaxial to the plane of the aorta, get a nice measurement. And here he's about 34 millimeters, and you want to be 40 millimeters as you cut off for aneurysm, and at 5.5 centimeters, typically where uh, patients will be recommended for surgery. And the uh, thora descending thoracic aorta, I want to use a cutoff about 30 millimeters, and this patient's at 26 millimeters. So I'm going to pay attention here to the heart now. So again, the heart is not well evaluated on non-contrast chest CT because there is motion and there is no contrast. So I can't tell the difference between the myocardium 
and the endoluminal part of the heart, the part that contains the blood. But what can I say about the heart? I can look for overall size of the heart. Does it look enlarged? And I can also look for a pericardial effusion here. You can see a small amount of fluid here around the heart. And if there's a large amount, then I want to comment that there's an effusion. If there's increase in, in size of fluid from a prior study, I can uh, talk about increasing pericardial fluid, which could be can be clinically relevant. Okay, so almost done with the search pattern for looking at non-contrast chest CT. I'm going to talk about, a little bit about the soft tissues now. So here you can see the soft tissue anatomy. You can see the subcutaneous fat and the muscle tissue here. This is the pectoralis muscle. Here you can see the muscles of the rotator cuff surrounding the scapula. And let's keep coming down here. You can see this long, flat, broad muscle, the latissimus. These are the deep back muscles. So I'm basically looking for any uh, obvious soft tissue lesions. Uh, you don't typically make a lot of findings in the soft tissues, but sometimes you can make uh, specific diagnoses. For example, if there's absence of the left pectoralis or any of the pectoralis muscles, that can be a diagnosis of Pullman syndrome. In a female patient, I would look at the breast tissue to look for any masses or any other focal lesions. Here I like to look on the bones on the sagittal plane. You can get a nice long axis of the thoracic spine. And you can assess for alignment. You can look for any focal osteolytic or osteoblastic lesions. Uh, typically metastatic lesions usually involve the spine, so you can get a good assessment of that on the sagittal view. This is in bone windows. And you can also assess the bones on a nice thin section axial view. I usually look at both the scapula, the clavicles, look at the ribs, and then looking at the thoracic spine vertebral bodies in the axial plane. Uh, looking for basically any any focal lesions, looking for any uh, healed rib fractures or acute rib fractures in the setting of trauma, looking at the marrow for any expansion. So other things I like to just go through before I close the case, I usually look at the esophagus here, which is collapsed. You can see the lumen of the esophagus here, and we don't get a good evaluation of the esophagus on the non-contrast chest CT, but just kind of look at it, looking for any obvious masses. I make sure I don't miss anything there. I also come down and check the abdomen for any findings and using a search pattern just like I use for CT of the abdomen pelvis. And uh, that's basically it. So that's basic uh, search pattern for looking at a non-contrast chest CT. I uh, hope that was helpful and uh, thank you for your time.